Hey, hey, hello there, and welcome to another episode of the Brand Architect podcast. Um, it's me, Annie Alexander, and today, yet again, we have a very exciting and interesting guest. Uh, probably uh, this is going to be uh, another free flow discussion, and we're going to talk a lot about stories. So uh, let's have our guest over. So I'm going to talk today to Dennis Mosley Williams. Um, welcome, Dennis. Annie, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And hello to everyone out there in Annie Land. Nice to have some time with you today. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, it's um, what I like about the Brand Architect podcast is that, you know, guests introduce other guests, which is mm -hmm. really, really cool. And, um, you know, apart from the fact that we can meet a diverse group of people who are approaching marketing from different angles, mm -hmm. it's also very interesting because I, I actually never know what we're going to talk about. So it's, it's, it's a real unscripted free flow, which is, uh, which makes things, uh, way more interesting i think at least for the host because if you know the questions in advance and if you have spoken about those topics with the guest before it's mm -hmm. not always so exciting so um so yeah uh, we're gonna free flow <laughs> i agree but so, as, as all of your fans would tell you it's all about the host not every host can pull off a free flow conversation some of them oh, are as good as their questions it's like uh oh you need questions you don't though so no pressure, late. no pressure here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's start just by you telling what you do, and then we can go from there. Absolutely. Okay, well, I am the founder of DMW Strategic Consulting, and my partner and I work with small to medium-sized businesses, and we help them become more profitable. And we focus on three things, strategy, execution, and innovation around customer experience and design. That's what we do. Okay, awesome. I mean, uh, probably, you know, those who listen, uh, who have listened to me for quite a while, uh, they will know that I'm, I'm probably going to focus most on the last part, on the third point. Sure. Um, but, uh, but we'll take it slowly. So, um, so tell us about like, oh, usually when I'm, when I'm having guests, most of them do their own stuff and all of them have this, you know, different, uh, interesting stories about how they actually left corporate and how did they decide to move on their own? Mm -hmm. So what's your story about that? Well, my story is probably a lot like everybody else's. I wish it was all full of, um, you know, courage and, you know, some kind of burning desire to go change the world. But in fact, like a lot of us, nope, it was an easy gradual transition that I was not even aware I was making. What happened was several years ago, I had a friend of mine who asked me to do some consulting work for him. Would you just come in? It wasn't paid consulting work. It was... I value your opinion as a person. So just come and tell me what you think. And my, this buddy of mine was a financial planner. So I went in and I, and I, I listened, he did a dress rehearsal essentially of a presentation he would do in a couple of days. And there were two things I thought when he, when I was watching him, the first was legitimately, oh, wow. He, he's the smartest person I've ever sat in a room with. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> He wants me here. I, I can't even follow the conversation. I was literally sitting there thinking everything I took at school was wrong. Like wow. what he knows, oh my goodness, what I know, oh, what am I going to do? The okay. second thing I thought was this, and I told him so. I said, if I had any money, I, I said to him, you're the smartest guy I've ever sat in a room with. He said, oh, thank you. I said, yeah, here's the bad news. <laughs> if I had any money, and I didn't. But if I had any, you would be the last person on earth I would give it to because I didn't understand a thing you said from the moment you started talking. And I said, <laughs> this was the beginning, like I had something figured out that I didn't even know I had figured out, but everybody else did. They went crazy for me and I couldn't figure out why. I wish I was as smart then as I am now. So what I was really getting at was this was my first hint that it isn't, like, again, he was a financial planner. So I said, the assumption that you are making is that people that have a lot of money are smart. Mm -hmm. And the assumption I'm making is people that have a lot of money, maybe maybe I'm wrong, but my assumption is 
their grandfather probably saved a lot of money. <laughs> okay. So I said, if I were yeah. you, I would talk less about the tactics of financial planning, but how smart you are and all the smart, clever things you would do. I'd mm -hmm. leave that. What I would talk to your clients about instead is what it feels like as a person to not have answers to questions that are important to you. Like, am I going to be okay? Do I have enough? Et cetera, et cetera. So why he, he's the hero of the story because he agreed that I was exactly right. He left everything that makes him comfortable behind. This is a guy that left financial planning and he went on to a really impressive career in finance. So finance numbers and tactics, that's his strong suit personality as we are still friends, and I will tell him I just said this about him online. His name's Steve Bain, by the way. <laughs> no, everyone will know. Personality wasn't necessarily his strong suit. Sweet guy and a wonderful guy, but you know, that's not his thing. Mm -hmm. he gave up everything. He's the hero. He gave up everything that made him comfortable and he embraced my way of doing it. And in a very short period of time, by doing so, he had a lot of success. Somebody noticed, one person called, another person called, and the next thing I knew, I was flying across all of North America, speaking at conferences um, about this thing that is the experience economy. This uh, That is not a, a term that I coined. That's from Joe Pine and Jim Gilmore, who wrote a book in 1999 called The Experience Economy. And what it argued is that selling excellent products and advice or solutions isn't enough to guarantee a business success, that there was this new economic offering, specifically the experience, and that that was what the whole business was about. And effectively, that's what I was saying to my buddy and everybody who would listen, is nobody actually cares as much as you think they do about what you right. do. They care about two things, how you do it, and yeah. they care about who you're helping them become. So it's really funny, Annie, because now here we are in, in 2020, the financial services industry is obsessed with this idea of guiding human transformation. It's like they just heard about it and it makes me realize what a lousy job I've done of <laughs> writing this message for 20 years. Like, though, this isn't new. I wrote a book about it so long ago. It's embarrassing now, you know? So that's, that's how I got started. And then just like you, you start and you never really stop. And I've just been growing a little tribe ever since and uh yeah. and away and here we are together connected of course as it always is through my tribe with steve sims and now here we are together yeah absolutely um my my viewers and listeners have seen C uh, steve on on the podcast twice already so yeah we, he, he's been here i think a bit over a month ago so we were um having a very interesting conversations with him as well um okay. but um you mentioned two things that I would like to dive into, actually. Yeah. Uh, one is about uh, personality. So we will talk about personality and content. Uh, and and the other one, uh, obviously, the, the experience um, that people are getting. So looking at the personality thing, uh, I, I think it's kind of, you know, it's very important to 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 showcase personality in your online content, in, in whatever you're doing, because yeah. probably that's the only thing that will truly differentiate you and we want to be, no one can copy it, right? Correct. And, um, the other thing though is, uh, do you think there is a need of some kind of balance? Like how, is there a limit to how personal you can get online? Because I, I, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, there are many people who are a bit, you know, uh, if, if there is a phrase like too transparent or like, you know, mm -hmm. adding up stuff that you don't, I mean, I don't really want to know what you had for breakfast, for example, Correct. Or, or, you know, just, yeah. is there a certain, like, how do you define that balance that is a healthy balance? Okay, so that's fun. <laughs> Like, can we just go back to the fact that you don't like to start by any sharing any questions? Like, nothing. We weren't going to share any questions. We just have a free-form conversation. But you should add, I like to start with a million-dollar question first. <laughs> I like to start with the fluffy question. Tell us about you. And then I dive right into the heart of the matter, Dennis, to watch you squirm live. Yeah, because why not, right? <laughs> why wouldn't you? It's Yeah, why wouldn't you? We're having fun. Okay, so that is the million-dollar question. So here it is. 
There's a lot of debate as to whether or not you can share too much. I agree with you. You can share too much. I agree. Mm -hmm. And the line that I walk is this. Do I find it interesting or do you find it interesting? To use your, your example, I find what I had for breakfast today interesting. You probably wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't share that. Now, let's talk about personality, experience, and authenticity. Mm -hmm. Ah, because because that's something I, I haven't struggled with, but it's really, I'll tell you a really cool story. And it comes from Steve Sims. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Let's well, hear I, it. I, I should say, um, in full disclosure, that I met Steve Sims at a conference in New York City last fall to everybody listening. He spoke just before me. And I hired Steve Sims essentially that day. I joked that I hired him right in the room, but I didn't because he left first. I, but I spoke with him within a day and said, oh, no, no, we're going to get this done. So here it is. Authenticity is at the heart of every experience. Okay, so in terms mm -hmm. of your personality and who you are, it has, we say at the heart of the experience economy are two things, authenticity and generosity. I mm -hmm. am true to myself. I am true with how I represent myself to others. And then, and generosity, I want to share it. I want mm -hmm. you to know. So then when we talk about experience, et cetera. So my experience, you know, we're all building our tribes. We're all building our audience. So my personality, I let people know who I am up yeah. to a point. That point could mm -hmm. be right this morning, right? Anything they're not going to find interesting about me, I don't tell them. Having said that, People, it's been my experience that people care more about who you are than what you do. Yeah. And they want you to be relatable. Yeah. Relevant, yeah. certainly. Certainly relevant. So anybody who says, oh, Dennis Bozo, and she's, I, I listen to Annie's podcast. I love to know. I'm going to check this guy out. Perfect. I have to be relevant to you. Now, once they leave you and come to me without you sort of holding their hand, you know, making the bridge between the two of us, then I need to be relatable. Mm -hmm. Who is this desk? Which is why, like, of all the things I've ever posted on on YouTube, for instance, the video that everybody loves is one with me driving with my daughter. That's mm -hmm. the one. It's got yeah. it, it, you would not believe the comments to this day I get about it because people see mm -hmm. how I talk to my daughter. She's sitting on my lap driving the car. And people just see how I interact with her and they get they they inform some sense of who I am. So relevant, certainly relatable absolutely and then lastly is of course reachable which was really is more the um you know the pro the, what you have in place for people to reach out and connect mm -hmm. with you quickly so can you share too much yes the line that i don't ever cross is if if i honestly tell myself you're the only one that would find that interesting then i don't share it and then of course yeah. i have different platforms as you know so more of my businessy thinking stuff i'm going to put on linkedin more of my personal relatable stuff I might share on Instagram, etc. I avoid things like politics and all the hot button issues because candidly, you're going to instantly alienate half of your listening audience or what have you the minute you yeah. identify. One it's with very that. polarizing, right? Exactly. Yeah, I totally get that. But yeah, can I be candid absolutely. with you? Sometimes I want to. So I can drive them all away from me. <laughs> Okay. That's yeah. Truth. That's the truth. Yeah, the, tem the temptation is big. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. so tell I me about uh, the guy today. I read the email. I read the last part of the email and literally said to myself, "Oh, that's too bad." <laughs> <laughs> hmm, yeah, I'm gonna put you on my B list now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about um, the experience uh, part of things. Like you know. Um, we have this expression which says don't sell a product sell an experience right people mm -hmm. don't really care too much about the features about the details of, of the the product itself they care yeah. about the benefits that it brings to their lives so right. um so and it feels like uh, i don't know if you compare uh, the past and 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 these days uh, do you think like this experience element is getting uh, a bigger weight these days and it's becoming way more important than before. Yes, absolutely. And particularly under the sort of COVID event, 
So I was asked mm -hmm. early on, one of my friends, a little dark humor said to me, hmm, this COVID stuff, is this kind of put in a nail in the experience economy? Like how, almost like, how are you gonna reinvent yourself now, you know? And I was like, mm -hmm. oh God, no. <laughs> it brought experience forward 10 years. In fact, just from where I, my house is here in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, there's a commercial strip of stores and shops, et cetera, about two blocks uh, south of here, right over there. And I walk that street all the time when in regular uh, regularly I do and I, uh -huh. I continue to and I'm looking at all these businesses and I'm trying to figure out what percentage of them will never reopen uh -huh. here's what I've come up with the businesses that are most likely to reopen and be fine this is all about experience would be cafes clubs bars restaurants with one important caveat which is we all have to want to leave and go there so uh -huh. they can open up their doors and they are an experience. They're a place where people connect, where community happens, where there's laughter and people watching and it's robust and wonderful. Providing we want to go. Now, what about the other half of the stores up there? Shoe stores, a clothing store, a furniture store. I don't know how those stores will ever, will ever reopen because uh -huh. with experience, because what's happened is in the last eight weeks, nine weeks now, maybe 10 weeks that we're all working from home is we're all shopping online like crazy. And yeah. I don't think that's going away. And an experience, and this is a great way to jump into the idea of what you said, experience and feature. So there are, there are rules to follow in the experience economy. And the first one is the one that everybody messes up. It's the most critical one. So of course, that's the one we screw up. And it's this, experiences are not services. And Everybody messes that up. We use those two words synonymously. Yeah, so true. This is so understand it this way. Service is about saving customers time and ultimately money. Make it as uh -huh. easy as possible. Whereas experience is about creating time well spent. Think about uh -huh. service as the drive-through window, as the pickup, the drop-off takeout, what have you. They make it quick and easy. You show up in a bag, they hand it to you and out the door you go, or they bring yep. it to your house. Experience mm -hmm. is about creating engagement within your client, a desire to continue to linger. So when you mm -hmm. talk about experience versus say features and benefits, ooh, yeah, that's dangerous because there is all kinds of evidence some of us have firsthand from our own marketing endeavors that people buy what they want, not what they need. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely true. So absolutely. And benefits are one thing, but features, once you're talking to your audience about features and benefits, whether you realize it or not, you're competing on price because the central argument here of the experience economy is this, everybody's stuff is the same. Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and the thing is, and the thing is that experience element, which is differentiating, mm -hmm. that you can't put a price tag on it. So it's very hard to compare it in, in prices, like, you know, the, the feature plus the experience of this person, you know, compared to the same features plus the experience of that person. That's because there. those experiences can't really be compared in, in, in money terms, right? That's it. So. In, uh, in last November, which uh, seems like a whole world away right now. My goodness. Pre-COVID so, times. Yeah. Uh, so last November, I was invited to and attended a really cool event. I went to the 20th anniversary relaunch of the book, The Experience Economy, with Joe Pine and Jim Gilmore. And they hosted it, for everybody who is tuning in from around the world here, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio. Wow. Oh, it was amazing. And of course, central to the argument of their book here is that all work is theater and every business is a stage, okay? So when I went mm -hmm. to the event, and it's wonderful to see Joe and Jim present, it's just, it's lovely. So, and I'm always amazed at how they can take this idea that so many of us latched onto, this idea that means so much to all of us. It's like having a favorite song. And then you, you go see the artist that wrote your favorite song and they say, here's two new verses you've never heard. And you're like, oh, I love the song. <laughs> you know? 
Yeah. So Joe was talking about what you're on about, which is the value of experience, et cetera, et cetera. And he put up this chart because, you know, it's really important when you think all businesses, every business in the world can be broken down to mm -hmm. right down to commodities. So Joe uses the famous example of coffee, which we're all enjoying today. Whoops, pardon me. Because, you know, at the heart of it, this entire billion dollar business is all about, at the end of the day, beans, mm -hmm. coffee beans. And whether we choose to sell them as raw products, whether we want to package them as goods, serve them as a service at the at the bodega on the corner, at the depaneur, as we say here in my part of the world, at the corner store or, or even a 7-Eleven or a vending machine, that's a service. But if you take that cup of coffee and you bring it down the street and you surround it in the theater of a Starbucks mm -hmm. and you mix in some escapist language, would you like a grande? Would you like a venti? Would you like an Americano, et cetera? And you come yeah. up with all kinds of ways to personalize it. Take a regular coffee shop experience. You're limited in your abilities to personalize it just for you. But some young lad on the internet came up with the number. And he argues there's 80,000 possible ways to, to prepare a coffee at Starbucks. 80,000 possible combinations before we put it in your hand. Okay, so Joe puts up this slide and he says, check this out. From, from 1999 to November 2019, the price of coffee as a commodity actually went down. They got cheaper. Coffee beans, he goes, they had a little flare up there 10 years ago, what have you. But for the most part, they've actually come down in price over 20 years. Now take experience, which is Starbucks. 20 years ago, you know, they went from like 2,500 stores or whatever it was to 30,000 stores. And they, they added $25 billion annually in revenue and it's like what did they do did they reinvent coffee no they reinvented drinking it they created economic value that people are willing to pay for by doing nothing but truly slowing the experience down creating a space a place where people want to linger which i think is just amazing and everyone listening who's thinking damn i wish i was a coffee shop i'd know what to go and do right now so this is what I want to plant as an yeah. idea. There's all of us are business owners. If you're a coffee shop, a musician, an architect, a podcast host, an engineer, it doesn't matter. We're all in the same business. And that business is attention. We're attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. We want to capture people's attention and hold it. Yeah. Okay. So what everybody should do, and this is and I and this is it, is is the following. You should, it's very easy to compare apples to apples. Oh, I'm a coffee shop. So I toured around and I sat in every other coffee shop and every little town I visited on my vacation, I just looked at it. Oh, and I saw what they were doing and I stole it. And I'm going to do that too. Well, that's easy when it's podcaster to podcaster, coffee shop to coffee shop. But what if you are, pick something obscure, a financial planner. <laughs> And you, I, I use that for a, for one reason, because they sell invisible stuff. So I like my examples yeah. to be as hard as possible for anybody. To, <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah. So you're a financial planner. You work there in London, England. Yep. And you love to go to this one coffee shop every day. You should go mm -hmm. and sit in that coffee shop. And instead of looking for best practices, you should look for best principles. Go to a place you love to be in that you don't ever buy anything at a store you love to visit, a business you hate to leave, whatever it is, and go there with a lot of time and sit there until what? Until you see it. See what? I don't know, but you'll know when you see it. It's like being in love. You'll just know. Watch how guests mm -hmm. enter businesses. Watch how staff interact with them. Watch where how people move, where they move, all those things. And anything that you see that delights you, pull it out of that business and apply it to your own. That's how you shift to experience. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. Although, you know what skeptics are going to say, those, you know, some of them who are yeah. listening here. Uh, all the examples are kind of physical locations and people meeting in person. Um, yeah. Things shifting to online. How do you, for example, like I have this challenge of uh, trying to understand all these 
conferences and events are shifting into virtual space, right? They are, yeah. they are turning into virtual conferences. What most of the organizers are doing, they are just, you know, copying and paste, trying to copy and paste the exact experience of the physical conferences and yeah. put that to the dig digital uh, space, hoping that people will get the same experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not so convinced that it's working that way. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, you probably have to come up with new experiences which are more suitable to the digital space, right? Yeah. So um, how, do you, how do you actually, like, you know, what are the specifics of the online space people should really take into account and kind of when they are uh, making the experiences, uh, just, you know, take that into account and... and modify accordingly or come up with fresh ideas like is just copying the same thing from physical bringing into the online the right way to look at it i don't think so i'm not the expert on this subject in fact um i was going to follow up with you and um and literally ask you that exact same question hey annie can you help me out with this help me understand this because <laughs> i want to say we are in okay so candidly candidly and um Full disclosure, I have to do a webinar in two days or so for a client of mine, and I have half of it ready. Mm -hmm. The half I don't have ready is the half that we're now discussing. And I just said to a, like a friend of mine earlier, I said, you know, this whole COVID thing is like nine weeks old. So we're not a lot of research right now. Like I said, yeah, you know, sure. generally speaking, not to be silly about it, but where do you start the investigation of anything? Google. I go to Google. Oh, and I yeah. find 50 academic papers. Go, oh, boy, I'll pick a few of these to start. You go looking on Google right now, but where the hell is this going? What do we, how do I have value to, you know, how do I continue to bring value to my clients when I can't call on them? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I can give you my version of it. And by the way, look, look who's there. Um, mm. Steve is watching. So yeah, nice. uh, we, we spoke of you, Steve, just a while ago. So shout out to Steve Sims. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, I mean, the way I approach this is, um, first of all, I'm kind of trying, I'm one of the people who were visiting conferences, right? So mm -hmm. I know what experience was there. And, and to be fair, it's, you know, from conference to conference, experiences were relatively different. But, you know, I, I know, like, what are the good ones? And I know what are, you know, the not so positive implications of, you know, the mm -hmm. travel and everything else that missing out to some of parts of, of, of the conference is, is not so bad, right? Right. Um, on the on the other hand, you you know, uh, instead of Google, what I'm trying to to how I'm trying to discover and the solution is by talking to people who were like going to conferences very often, mm -hmm. trying to understand why they were going to it, how they were spending the time there. Because what I've discovered was that uh, most of them didn't go there for the keynote speeches. Right. They didn't go there to to meet all these big names, um, and most of them weren't even in the halls listening to to the people on the stage. They were mainly networking during the coffee breaks and That's and right. lunch breaks, and and they were there to meet other attendees versus you know people who are on on the website. Mm -hmm. So um, so which which means that you you know the networking element and the the communication part is very important and replicating that probably is the hardest part of all because if you yeah. know key, keynote speeches is the easy part you just live stream the the keynote slides and you talk over them and it's done right and exactly if we want to stick specifically with um, with conferences, I think you're exactly right. So here's two features of the experience economy that apply. The first is, so the three rules of experience economy are the following. The first I've mentioned already, services are not experiences. They're designed mm -hmm. and intended to do different things. And honestly, everyone, if you're going to pull one thing out of this visit today, that's the one. Okay, then think on that deeply. The second and third relate, apply directly, I should say, to conferences. Here's the second rule. Time is the currency of experience. We pay for experience with time. It's, yeah. when it's worth it, you sign up a year ahead. You buy, your favorite singer um, announces they're coming to London. You buy a ticket nine months out. For nine months, you're anticipating it. 
Okay. That's so what you, I did. And then COVID came in and my ticket was, <laughs> yeah. Who are you going to see? Uh, there is a band called um, uh, Cigarettes After Sex. Get to know you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fair enough. <laughs> I'll look it up. Okay, so the first, the second rule is that time is the, uh, the currency of experience. Here's the third. The customer is the product. Now, in disgusting sales speak, that means you never stop selling the customer. You just keep selling the customer. No, 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 no. In experience economy, it means this. The transformation of the client is the end goal. Who we turn the client into. Nike running shoes is not about running shoes. It's about just do it. It's about turning the person who buys Nike, helping yeah. them become their inspiration. Okay, so let's go to conferences. What you just said is hysterical and accurate on too many levels. I could riff on it for a day. What, what you said, <laughs> nobody goes to see the keynote. I was like, oh. <laughs> So I want I'm, I'm sorry. Not to I'm sorry, but that's, that's what my research says. Yeah. I know, it's okay. Because truly, since this hit, I've been getting a lot of phone calls from conference planners, event planners asking me, what do you think? Where's this going? So this is what I'm going to tell you. Zoom. Do you know that in the last nine weeks, I've done more of these than I've done in a year, any, any, any time period? Like I... Yeah. This has become so natural and normal to me now. Why would I ever go back to talking to anybody on the phone and not seeing their faces? Mm -hmm. I can't. This is the way it goes. So you could have all kinds of conferences online like this that are virtual that we can tune into whenever we want. Let's go to the physical conference as a service. Think progression of economic value. What you said is so accurate. What's the best part of the conference for everybody who goes? The person they meet by chance at lunch. Yeah. And then I met this guy named Steve. Then I met this woman named Annie. We had this amazing conversation at lunch. Oh, and how did you meet Annie? I was standing with a plate of stuff, looking around, and Annie looked at me and went, you can sit here if you want. So by chance, I sit beside this total stranger. We have this great connection. So take those two rules I just told you, time and transformation. The conference of the future, the mid-range deal where we all go downtown to the Four Seasons and there's 400 people and the keynotes are there and the rest of it, that mm -hmm. conference is now going to start before you ever leave your house. They'll put us into, if you're smart, you'll put people into groups before they ever come. You want me to have my meeting with Annie before I ever get there. Put us into silos. Let us identify the questions that we want to uh, dig into so that when we show up, we're part of a cohort. We see the speakers, but the breakouts and the lunches are all structured around answering questions. Imagine if everybody coming to the conference was divided into subjects and we'd already been thinking and working on them. So when we meet our group, we're the group that identified as we want to know about social media. So we've done all of our homework and we're bringing it in. Then the third level. So in other words, in the service level of conferences right now or previous to COVID, the conference existed to push information. Yeah. Hey, and there's a lot of work that was done, a lot of money spent. We organized the whole damn thing. We got all these great speakers. Again, it's how I met Steve Sims. We have all these speakers. But the difference was, as I joked, I said, Steve left before I was finished speaking. So I couldn't hire him that minute. I had to wait a day. Then uh -huh. that night, I went out to dinner with eight advisors. Well, they got to have time with me. Oh, that was amazing. So let's go to this idea of the third kind of conference, smaller um, longer and more mm -hmm. meaningful and, and impactful. In other words, just to keep using me and Steve. So now he finishes talking, he gets off stage and sits down. And I do too. Yeah. We're not going anywhere. And we're all, maybe there's gonna be less people and we'll be there to work together. So higher quality interaction with less people. Correct. Is saying, basically. Correct. Yeah. That's where it's at. Yeah. Because they all the, this tech is here, right? Like even just yesterday, I said to my partner, Tom, I said, all these people that are working on this e-course thing, we should reach out to them and say, hey, you're working through this and you're all on your own. And we know that we designed it that way. You're supposed to work on it on your own. But you want to hook up on, on Facebook Tuesday night at seven o'clock and a little study group and we can ask questions. So this tech, it's all going to come together. But at the end of the day, the focus will always be on transforming the attendee. Not just pushing yeah. information. I totally get that. So as a follow-up to that, in that case, uh, mm -hmm. 
you know, um, transforming the attendee, if you put it the parallels, uh, if you are creating a content online for your audience, you want to transform your audience and you want them to experience um, something so they can, as you put it, linger longer and then, you know, want to come back to you uh, yeah. over and over again. So, um, how do you actually uh, create those experiences? Is it through the content uh, topics, con content itself? Is it through your personality or your interaction and engagement? Like, what are the elements that you have to put together all the pieces in order to to come up and and end up with an experience that is going to be, you know, strong enough to keep them around and to have them bring others to your audience actually okay that's a that's a great question here's a hopefully great answer the so number one is this the experience has nothing to do with the goods or the service mm -hmm. so when you're thinking about how do i turn and we'll just keep with starbucks because as an example it makes sense to everybody as we've all experienced it starbucks experience has nothing to do with the coffee yeah. It has everything to do with the drinking experience. So that's part one, okay, is to understand. And that's a really hard, hard, hard thing. I work with a lot of clients. And early on, the number of times I have to say, Annie, you're thinking about your podcast again. Oh, right, right, right. Annie, you're thinking about that thing again. No, it's not yeah. about that. They don't care. It's There's this wonderful interview you can find somewhere on the internet. Having said that, I've never managed to find it again. God, I used to find it all the time. Google it. Howard Schultz of Starbucks is having a talk with this guy, interviewer. And the interviewer keeps bringing up the coffee. And Howard will, the first few times he says, oh, thank you. And then he goes, dives back into talking experience. And on the last time the guy says, blah, 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 the coffee. Mm -hmm. Howard looks and goes, okay, you keep asking me about the coffee. And the guy says, well, I love your coffee. It's so strong. It's this, it's that. And Howard just looks at him and he goes, yeah, yeah. Other people hate our coffee. And, and he just lets it sit in the room like this big mess. And then he says this, it's not about the coffee. I haven't thought about the coffee in 25 years. <laughs> okay, like just shuts them up. It's about drinking it. So let's go into that idea. The second part of your question here is, how does one stage an experience? I would be remiss if I didn't tell everybody, well, you really ought to read the book, The Experience Economy, before I go any further. That's good step one for everybody. So here's the short answer. Your experience has to be informed by what we refer to as a theme. It's the conceptual law that informs every single thing that you do. This is not your mission statement. The mission statement of Starbucks is to sell coffee. Their mission, it's, they say it really nicely. They say to inspire the human spirit one sip, one cup, one neighborhood at a time. Translation, by opening stores in every neighborhood we can get. <laughs> okay, that's what they do. True. But, and there's nothing wrong with that. They're a business, but their, their theme is not their mission. Their theme is behind the mission and they never tell anybody. It's a secret. And here's what it is. Home, work, Starbucks. No. What does that mean? It means this. The whole raison d'etre of Starbucks is to make every person who walks in the door feel like they own the place, like they're at home. There's two things that Annie owns, her job and her home. This is, this is Starbucks feeling. Everything else that Annie touches, she's just using it. She uses the record store. She uses the grocery store. She uses public transportation. She used, that's it. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to be the third thing she owns, home, work, Starbucks. So here's the part of point of departure from, say, any other coffee shop. If when every, when every other coffee shop represented by a person wakes up in the morning, they're thinking about one thing. How am I going to sell more coffee? And what do they come up with? Service solutions, which are saving people time and money. Let's put in a drive through window. Let's bundle it up and commoditize it. If you buy a coffee and a breakfast sandwich, the whole thing will only cost this. We'll, we'll drive units. We'll compete on price. The death of every business, commoditization. Whereas Starbucks as a person gets up every single day with a different question, which is how am I going to make Annie feel at home today? That's an entirely different business. 
So yeah. work with, you come up with a, with a theme that you never share, and then the impressions that you want to make. Impressions aren't services. They're not features. They're not benefits. They're feelings, everybody. Mm -hmm. relevant, relatable, reachable. Dennis, one of the impressions I like to make on all of my clients is that I'm busy, but never in a hurry. Never mm -hmm. in a hurry. Okay. Yeah, Another is yeah. that I'm professional, but not prickly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another is I'm serious. I'll get this done. This will work. You're going to be happy. Da, da, da. But I'm not serious. I'm serious, but I'm not serious. These are impressions I want to make. Okay. Now look at your physical space, everybody out there. Take your theme. Take your impressions. Look around your, your environment. What do you need to harmonize? What, when you look at it, makes no sense? It messes with your the impressions you want to make. It sells con send conflicting signals. Eliminate it. Unless it's like, not this, this I love, then shine a light on it and <laughs> do it more often. And then consider, of course, your five senses. Experience is multisensory. What do people see, hear? What sense of taste literally does your business evoke? What sense of smell, touch? When you look at a Starbucks, and I'll just keep using them, something people don't notice until I point it out. A harmonizing cue at Starbucks would be the language they use, but also mm -hmm. lighting. Starbucks coffee shops are not lit up at night from the outside. There's no lights shining on them. The lights are shining from inside. They're like a beacon telling you to come uh -huh. home. Those are little tiny things that you might say, oh, I've noticed that. I just think that's so clever. And some other person who's, who's the you know the, the biggest Starbucks fan in the world said, what the hell, I've never even noticed. I never even noticed yeah. that. And then finally think signature moments, little things you do for clients that delight them and memorabilia. That's, that's how experience is designed. It's never about the information. It's never about the coffee. It's not the conference, the coffee, the tires. It's the client and who we're helping them become. And it's about engaging and delighting them in an inherently personal way. That has yeah. value to clients. Sounds, sounds awesome. So let's get to the important part of it. Mm -mm. Uh, I mean... We titled our episode, How to Become the Story Everyone is Sharing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, everyone, no matter how, how much coverage and exposure you've got, it's always nicer when, you know, even, even not for growth, but just, you know, I, I, I always prefer others to, to, to drive people to my content versus me self-promoting and broadcasting it to others, right? Yeah. So it's always this element of, you know, third-party endorsement, being that more genuine, more objective, right? And and as you say, the, when when people, when others are sharing your story or when others are sharing what you have created, mm -hmm. um, while they share it, they also talk about those experiences, which yeah. you can't really talk for them, right? Correct. So, which is why it's always nicer when someone else is, is is talking about you and sharing your content or whatever you've created, your books, your your articles, uh, everything else, uh, because it's it, it's just reflecting the you know it it, it reflects the experience as well in it. But mm -hmm. you have to get to a certain point in terms of first of all have, making those experiences um, with 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 the first core audience first right yeah. and and also kind of you know creating the the quality of the relationship that builds trust and builds that relationship to a stage where people want want to go out and and bring more people towards you right yeah. so how do you get to that point okay i appreciate that all your questions are two minutes long <laughs> that's perfect it's like what are you writing i am writing down the nine questions that were packed into that one question you said something earlier, but we did establish early on, you said it'd be free flowing. And I said, well, you have to be a good host to pull that off. And you did, so you knew. So you said something earlier about features and benefits. Yeah. Well, let's start there for everybody in Annie land. I'll give you a scenario to imagine. You're meeting with a prospect, mm -hmm. prospective client, and this prospective client desperately needs what you have. Frigga Zofar. Okay, good news, more good news. 
the stuff you have is better than anybody else's stuff. Woo. I definitely need what you have, and yours is so much better than your competition. It's ridiculous. Gets even better. For reasons that make no sense to anybody, yours is also cheaper. It's cheaper. And it's easier to buy. There are fewer obstacles. You can just have it. So everybody in blog land, any land, do you think you're going to close that deal? That's a gross expression, by the way. I don't usually use close the deal. Sounds very failed. But just the same. They need it. You've got it. Yours is better, cheaper, and easier to buy. You're going to get it? And here's the answer. I have no idea. It all depends on what you tell them. Mm -hmm. Because people that win, the story that wins is the story. The features and benefits, the evidence supports the story. It isn't the story. Yeah. It's, it supports the story. And I know this is true because, as I said earlier, because we've all bought things we wanted, not that we needed. And conversely, yeah. we've, had other, we've, we've had prospects say, yeah, I'm going the other way. And we realized, oh. So the end goal here is this. To become the story. When you become a story, that when someone hears it, they say, wait, tell me that again. You won. You want to be the story that people want to hear again. Because when somebody says, okay, tell me about that. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Tell me that again. What they're really telling you is, I want to be a part of that. Here's how, here's how you become the story that everybody wants to share. And let's, and I think you said something at the very end about it, it's great once you get to critical mass, but what if you're brand new? What if you just started, you just hung your shingle out, as we say over here, eight weeks ago when your career got sidelined and now you started this new consulting business out of your apartment and somebody said, listen to Annie and this is the first thing you're listening to. And you go, oh yeah, I know and I have no clients. Okay, good news. We're all startups now. Mm -hmm. You start with the smallest viable audience that you can make a difference for and start right there, okay? And do your work generously and mm -hmm. compassionately. Do more yeah. than any person would think is reasonable. Here's mm -hmm. where I'm coming from. There's two kinds of work in the world, only two. There's the assigned work, and there's the required work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody in the world does assigned work and everybody, including me, although just recently, has been commoditized. Everybody, all assigned work is commoditized. There's people that know a lot that are willing to put it online for free just to get eyeballs at them. There's somebody yeah. else willing to do your professional work the first time for free or at a loss just so they have something to point to for their next client. Mm. Yeah. And meanwhile, let's talk about required work. Required is necessary work that nobody is asking anybody to do. If you want to become the story that everybody's sharing, you A, have to be doing something nobody else is willing to do, which is often generous human work. It's uh -huh. generally speaking comes from the required side of the ledger, not the assigned side of the ledger. Now, the good news for everybody out there listening thinking, damn, we're all going to be lining up to do that. Not a chance. Are you crazy? Humans are humans. They want to do as little as possible. True. Yeah. This co every person I talk to, everybody out there listening. So when you have these COVID conversations, where is this going? What's it going to be like later? What will the new normal be? La, 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 la. All that stuff. Okay. First of all, none of us know. But here's what I'm betting on. I'm betting on humans. Mm -hmm. I'm betting that humans will try to get this show right back to as close as we had it before. That's what I believe. We're people. People are people. They're predictable. This is what we want. We want it this way. We'll figure out a way to get it back that way. Experience transformation is, is everything. Peter Drucker said a million years ago, he said, marketing should kill sales. You shouldn't have a sales department. You should have a marketing department. You don't need a salesperson. You need stories, stories that bring people in. Well, I don't know if Joe Pine officially said this, but I'm giving it to him. Experience will kill marketing. Experience is your best marketing. All I would do is zero in on, like whenever somebody says to me, how do I attract more clients? I always say, you know, by asking a better question than that. The question isn't how do I attract people to my business? The question is how do I matter more 
to the clients that I already have. And, you know, that, so what happens when you focus on it that way? You get people Absolutely. telling stories and you get people saying, okay, wait, tell me that story again. And that, that's the, more so than even the sale, our, our, our goal should be to be a story everybody wants to hear twice, every time. Okay. Yeah. That's what we should strive for basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes complete sense. Well, I mean, uh, I would like to wrap up in this positive note because I, right. I do believe that all this will be eventually gone. Uh, and, um, maybe some of that we shouldn't forget because I, I feel like, you know, these, these times put people in, in a space where they started doing things that they they wouldn't do otherwise um mm -hmm. so you know many people kind of you know non techy people ended up learning this For technology sure. and doing things online many people ended up uh, creating their own uh, new things uh, self developing reading more and all that stuff so i i, I truly think that it's, it it was a good start and i hopefully it's not going to be just a new year's resolution in a gym for just one month and then you forget about it when all this is gone mm -hmm. uh, and i feel like at the end of all that uh we all will be getting out of this much stronger so um that's kind of the the good side of it so so yeah thank you very much for your time i i really enjoyed the conversation i i mean you know um uh, it's definitely been um different from from the others which is what i always try to do but after 200 interviews it's becoming harder and harder to sort of you know have a completely unique topics and guests um but yeah I mean, I think we managed pretty well this time. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Anna. It was a pleasure for me okay. too. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for everyone who was watching and who's going to listen to the audio version of the podcast. Please make sure that you subscribe for it and, and please leave, leave me a review because, you know, those are the stories that others will be reading about. That's it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Annie. Cheers.